Ichimon Japan is made possible by Patreon support. Robert, thank you so much for joining the $3 a month plus alpha tier. And thank you for sending me that link for setting up the private RSS feed. <laughs> I was honestly intending to get that done uh, soon and uh, you helped make that possible. So now it's done, it's set up and you and the other $3 a month plus alpha tier members have access to Japanese Plus Alpha, my other podcast. Anyway, if you, the listener listening to this right now, can afford to do so and would like to support Ichimon Japan, Japan Station, Japan Kyo, all that stuff, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. But yeah, so um, sometimes fake kanji become real kanji, just like Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> but only if they're good boys. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to Ichimon Japan. I am Tony and... And I'm Ryan. And today we're joined by someone else, a former classmate of ours from when we were at the University of Hawaii's Japanese language and linguistics department studying our masters. Did I get that right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So we were, all, we were all in the graduate program at University of Hawaii, and today we're joined by Christine. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful to, to catch up with you because we haven't talked to you in a couple of years, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's been three and a half for me, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so just context, uh, Ryan got to, he, he started his master's, uh, what, like a year or two before me, I think, right? Was I before both of you? I thought me and you were like, the, well, I started like, I was a winter arrival. So I didn't remember if I was like one oh, semester uh, before or after you. Uh, yeah, it was either one or two semesters before me. Probably one if you started in the winter. Because okay. I, started, I probably started the next fall. And then uh, Christine started the year after me. So yeah. Ryan is, is uh, the, the big senpai. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. So they will call me senpai now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, Christine's specialty uh, or big area of interest involved kanji, right? Yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah. So I do I've been second wondering for reading. 15 years, what is a kanji? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that. Um, so, and, and Christine is currently continuing her studies, but in, in Pennsylvania in a PhD program involving second language acquisition, right? Yep. Yep. Second language and, reading. Yep. Oh, okay. And that does involve some kanji as well, right? Yeah, it does. Yep. Three or four. Awesome. Three or four, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thousand. <laughs> thousand. <laughs> Three or four thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, so I, I wanted to discuss kanji in some creative way today. And of course, that, that instantly brought to mind Christine, because I am... Kanji is definitely my weakest area in Japanese. And uh, Ryan, how do you feel about kanji? It's difficult. I don't know if it's my weakest area. It's difficult. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I do find it very interesting, but uh, Christine has a passion for kanji, so I, <laughs> I had to have her on. Um, anyway, so I, I, should, I should say what I always say. Um, Ichimon means one question. And so every episode we ask a question about Japan, some, something related to Japan, and then we try to answer it. And today's question is, how do you create fake kanji? So there's a big business for counterfeit kanji. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So today yep. we'll teach you how everything you need to know. Yep. So first you need a high quality printer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so base. Let's go back to what Ryan was saying. What is a kanji? <laughs> Christine, what's a what's this kanji thing that we're talking about? <laughs> right. So basically, kanji are. Um, borrowed from Chinese. I'm sure we know this, right? So they're yeah. characters that have been borrowed. So it's a way of encoding language, right? So I think a lot of people just think of them as like pictographs, right? But there, mm -hmm. there are many different kinds of kanji, maybe only about a hundred-ish of them are actually, you know, pictographs. And then mm -hmm. we have some that are like ideographs where they're combinations of, you know, different ideas. And then um, there are ones that are composed of a phonetic radical, and a semantic radical. So um, I don't know if we wanted to go into that right away or if we wanted 
a little bit more background about what kanji um, actually are. So <laughs> let, yeah, let's let's give just a little bit of background for just the the people mm -hmm. that aren't too familiar with the Japanese writing system. So mm -hmm. you know, just in a very basic basic way here, there's the three basic. Japanese writing systems. There's the hiragana, katakana, phonetic alphabets, and then we have the kanji that we were talking about, borrowed from Chinese, and like you were saying, can be like representing something or representing an idea. And they have many different readings. And in Japanese, what you do is you combine them all into this wonderful little soup that seems extremely <laughs> overwhelming at first, but after a while, you you actually figure out that there's a real logic to it, and this is why. For example, Japanese doesn't use spaces, right? Because mm. yeah. you can combine mm. these and, you know, kanji with hiragana and, and katakana and you realize where words end, where words start, which are the functional like particles, which are, you know, the actual nouns, which are the verbs. And it's all related because if you were to write everything with hiragana or everything with katakana, it would just be a whole jumbled mess and you wouldn't be able to read anything. Yeah. So, um, But you can just add spaces and solve the problem. Yeah, you can, and then you end up with like <laughs> super long books. <laughs> <laughs> that and it doesn't help with uh, homophones very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which Japanese yeah. has a lot. Oh yeah, there's tons. Yes, there's yeah. tons. It's it's like wait, isn't this the same word as this? And like, nope, different kanji. <laughs> That's what you often hear. So, uh, so yeah, kanji came in from China. They say like. Uh, the first records seem to be like in the first century, but it wasn't until like the early fifth century, so the 400s, when it seems like it became more commonly used and systematized to and adapted with Japanese, but it was mainly still like a very Chinese way of using it. And over the years, it's become, you know, what it is now. We're not going to get into whole history thing because that would be a whole different episode. Um, <laughs> and in daily use... The, there, there's the Joyo kanji, which are the general use kanji, that is 2,136 as of uh, 2010. So uh, by the time you finish high school, you're supposed to be able to, you know, understand and, and you know, comprehend that much. But there are many more, many, many, many more kanji, and even within Japan, um, that are used sometimes for very specific uses or like uh, place names. You know, there's very specialized kanji that, so people do know more than that. But on a daily basis, they use far less than the 2,136. Uh, so back to the question, how do you create a fake kanji? And that is deeply related to both Christine's research and what we stopped discussing a little while ago, the whole way that kanji is composed, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's address that first. And then we're going to get into some interesting kind of tangentially related things uh, to a whole bunch of other stuff. But Christine, could you explain that aspect of it? Yeah, so creating fake kanji, there was this really cool study um, done. It's actually done in China. It's by um, Bryant and um, I think Ho and Bryant, 1999. Mm -hmm. They actually were looking at um, Chinese children's ability to make fake characters. So what they've discovered was like the second, third graders, what they were doing where they were using a lot of the pictograph ones mm -hmm. to combine them kind of like as like an idi ideograph. Mm -hmm. While the fourth and fifth graders, they were actually using a semantic radical on uh, the left side and then a phonetic radical on the right side. So mm -hmm. that's what the majority of kanji are. So when, So if you... I guess want to develop your orthographic awareness, right? Uh -huh. This is maybe a more sophisticated way of making fake kanji, right? right? So you'll have a, so this is related to onyomi, this idea of phonetic radicals, right? So mm -hmm. on the left-hand side, for example, um, let's have, let's say we have wood. Yeah. We can have wood on the left and then on the right-hand side, we can have something um, I don't know, some something that you know to be pronounced as coal, mm -hmm. right? And then the this kind of reflects that right-hand side radical, mm -hmm. kind of reflects the overall meaning, uh, not meaning, uh, sound for this character. Mm -hmm. right? So that's like one way you can make uh, fake characters. So um, what that study was actually looking at was kind of tapping into their awareness of radicals. 
mm-hmm. right? So they, so as you're studying Japanese and developing your awareness, when you're at the point where you can kind of recognize mm-hmm. um, phonetic radicals and how to pronounce them, that's kind of showing. I don't want to say like an advanced understanding of kanji, mm-hmm. but that's kind of what it seemed like the studies were saying. Right. Yeah. Right. So, like. Um, Kanji are composed of these radicals, right? These um, there, there's there's many many different kinds, but for example, uh, there's the, the one um, for any stuff related to wood, I guess, right? Like you said, mm-hmm. right? And you would have a a little tree on the left side, correct? Yep. Yeah, and so depending on which area, like the left side, the right side, the top. Uh, the top or the bottom or the bottom left, they all have different names, and mm-hmm. um, often they will contribute to how you read it, right? For semantic radicals. Uh, for the well, there's the phonetic ones and there's the semantic ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this, yeah. So the semantic ones, I don't think they really contribute to how to pronounce it, but they might give you like a hint to the overall category, right? Of the character. Um, a lot of times it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we know this, and that's yeah. why kanji are so frustrating, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So yeah, so something like ha- hajimeru or something, yeah. right? Yeah. So right, that one has onna, right, woman yeah. on the left, but it doesn't yeah, actually woman. have anything to do with the category of woman or uh, something like uh, kimeru uh-huh. to decide something that has water radical yeah. on the left, but again, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the overall meaning. But many water of them water is extremely decisive. <laughs> I mean, that might be a good mnemonic device to memorize it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Seriously, yeah. these sort of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So being able to pick characters apart like that, mm-hmm. I think, is a good way to help learn them. Actually, even if it's a silly something as silly as that, I think it's a good way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can take those apart, and I've done this too, to help like remember the general meaning of mm-hmm. of like the the kanji. And then for me, at least, like often, because my spoken and, and listening were so much higher when I was at l- such a higher level when I was still studying, trying to figure out kanji, I, I was able to kind of get an idea of like, oh, this is how you read it because this is the general idea. And then I would be able to put it into context from the words that I already know, right? Yeah. So um, being able to like pick apart a kanji like that is very, very helpful. And um, in in many cases, when you're discussing like that, like some can give you either a hint for, like you said, the, the meaning or how you would read it. Mm-hmm. Um, Ryan, how did you go about studying kanji? Have you taken this approach? I'm not even sure what approach I've taken. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of just general reading? Yeah, basically my strategy has been read a whole bunch and try to like see them in the context they're used. Because mm-hmm. it's definitely true some of them are made where the radicals can kind of clue you into what they mean. There's uh-huh. also so many where it doesn't help, as we mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I'm I'm aware of it. Basically, I think I approach it by trying to read natural texts, see what the context is, see like how it's used, and then kind of retroactively be like, "Oh, it's composed of these two. That's why it means that." Whenever that works, right, and whenever right. the radicals don't explain anything, just be like, "Oh, okay, whatever. It's this." Right, 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 right. <laughs> That's a really good strategy. That kind of like lexical inferencing strategy. So there's a lot of papers that say when you incorporate both contextual information mm-hmm. um, and kind of what you're doing is kind of like morphology, right? You're picking apart the different, it's kind of like smaller sub morphemic information, right? Mm-hmm. So when you pick all that apart and you recognize it, it helps you like build your lexical quality. So that that representation of the word is a little bit stronger because mm-hmm. you're seeing it in context and recognizing the mm-hmm. different smaller parts within it. So, yeah, there are a lot, that's a really good strategy. That's actually what they tell you to do. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. happy I stumbled into it. When, yeah. when I was a beginner, I did try, like, the old-fashioned, like, flashcards and stuff, but so it, many it of them really look helps. so similar, yeah. Mm, it really helps to do it in context. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, because that's where you're always going to be seeing it, too. You're never going to see them just, like, randomly... Unless you're on a quiz show. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> or, or participating in some academic research. <laughs> true. That is also Even now, true. it still kind of happens, like, though, where like if I see one just like by itself, like on a test, I'll be like, I don't remember what this is. But then if I see it in a sentence, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. me too. Me too. Totally. 
yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, Christine, so what was the focus of your research then? Yeah, so what I did was um, I was looking at um, teaching, right? So mm-hmm. if you teach phonetic radicals, are students more likely to infer the overall meaning of the word correctly? So you might be thinking, okay, like what does that sound have to do with the character's meaning? Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of studies that show that um, basically the language you grew up reading, your first, the first language you grew up reading, that kind of the way you process it actually affects how you read in your second language. So if you so if you are from if you're using two different writing systems, it's going to have an effect on your second mm. one. So like so for us, right? We all grew up reading an alphabetic language. So this alphabetic language, because we come from an alphabetic reading background, mm. we really heavily rely on phonological information while we're reading. So when we look at kanji, kanji mm. is really complicated because they're two different, well, more than two different mm-hmm. ways of pronouncing it, right? We have kunyomi and onyomi, um, and then there's other special readings that we have. So because of this inconsistency in how we read it, it kind of um, kind of ties up our working memory. It gets, it, 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 because we cannot f- figure out how to pronounce this one character, it kind of breaks down all the other processes that you're trying to do. We get so hung up on, oh man, I don't know how to pronounce this. I don't know what this character is. I've never seen it before. So in the mm-hmm. context, you're like, oh no, like what do what do I do? So you start trying to rely on other things like context. So what they found is if you know how to pronounce that character or have a method, a strategy for inferring the pron- pronunciation correctly, it helps you kind of stop that kind of breakdown in your mind, <laughs> basically. Mm-hmm. So basically, if you have that sound, you're like, oh, okay, you're a little bit more confident maybe Mm. going into it, like subconsciously, I guess, right? And then it'll help you piece together the rest of the sentence. Uh, Like you'll hold that that sound in your memory a little bit longer, right? So basically what I did is I I found there's this um, article that had, it's like a corpus study where they did um, a lot of phonetic radicals and they listed the ones that were the... 100% 100% reliable in pronunciation. Of course, for onyomi, not kunyomi. This doesn't help with, the strategy doesn't help with kunyomi at all. Right, so um, onyomi is the, you could say like Chinese reading, although it mm-hmm. doesn't, you know, it's not the exact it's very same different from Chinese. <laughs> Chinese-inspired yeah, reading, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Based on Chinese and usually used when they're in a combination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so from bunch of different dynasties over time long long time ago yeah so that's why Mm -hmm. they have like three or four different ways of being pronounced because they were borrowed in like three or four different time periods from different areas and different different languages in chinese yeah so because they have all these different sounds right i picked the one that only has one onyomi reading and i taught Mm -hmm. My, like I taught, um, I did had an experimental group, a control group. I taught the experimental group, okay, let's memorize these phonetic radicals. And then I gave them mm-hmm. um, a word in context um, using this phonetic radical to see if they were more likely to infer the meaning correctly and ran statistics. And yeah, there was a relationship between your ability to pronounce it right and the ability to infer the meaning correctly. So um, even if it's not just um, inferring the meaning, I think also research has shown that when you learn a kanji, it's, I mean, yeah, knowing the meaning of it is very important. That's the ultimate goal of reading, right, is to know mm-hmm. yeah. what that word means. But because, again, we're back from an alpha, alphabetic writing system, that's our first language, right? So when we learn mm-hmm. kanji, we should learn the sounds. You should always learn mm-hmm. how to pronounce it. And then mm-hmm. maybe <laughs> go ahead and do the meaning. So that's how I studied, basically, is I, uh, the summer before I studied abroad, the first time, I mm-hmm. had a book with the, the first 1,000 kanji, and I just memorized all the onyomi. Mm-hmm. And I got to Japan, and I could read a lot more signs and stuff. It mm-hmm. was pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, I, so I'm really weak with kunyomi. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of native Japanese words, I, I mean, I'm going through, but like, yeah, yeah, like I'll forget how to read some of them. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yep. But I feel yeah, it's like, like a little bit reversed from the normal approach. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but I think when, right, but when when you're reading like newspapers or academic texts, like mm. things I'm doing right that I'm I'm using I'm using Japanese for, mm. a lot of it's academic. So as you as I think Ryan said, right, a lot of two character words will actually take onyomi, right? right so right. yeah, so that's my method, and mm-hmm. yeah, so, I have a job, so it's working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I think totally yeah, does. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's my research. Yeah, mm-hmm. is. Um, looking at um, second language reading for uh, like two character words and inferring the meaning and the relationship between that and phonological information. Yep. So then w- would you recommend you know, getting uh, as part of studying Japanese to better uh, understand these phonetic like pronunciation radicals? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? I have a paper. I could mm-hmm. probably uh, give it to you a little bit later if mm-hmm. anybody wants to look at it. Sure. But it kind of lists like uh, all the radicals and then like the reliability, mm-hmm. like how how how, oh, how wow. reliable you should expect it to be. So there's 23 mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. 100% only one onyomi. Of course, this is in uh, the Joyo Kanji's context. So if you're studying mm-hmm. outside of that, like place names or, you know, more... I, I don't know how to say like outside of daily many. use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's There's not going to help you probably to pronounce yeah. it. Like if you start going to like kanken kind of kanji, then it's probably not going to help you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then if the, then there's like an, a bracket for 90% to 99% reliability. There's 22 in there. So it has like one or two ways of being pronounced and so mm-hmm. on. Right. So um, I think even where I'm teaching right now, there's not a lot of guidance for kanji that we just kind of give them a workbook and say, go, <laughs> we don't, we don't really, you know, nope. try to break it down or teach in context, even vocabulary learning, you know? So I think, yeah, I think it, it depends mm-hmm. on your, I think your personality, not even your personality, maybe your learning style would be a better way of saying it. Right. So I'm a very like visual kind of learner, I guess. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like kind of, you know, mm-hmm. writing them for me or something like that, I think helps me a lot. But I think for maybe other types of people, you know, maybe like like Ryan's strategy, right? So everybody has a different method. So do what's um, good for you, right? Don't, you know, just because, mm-hmm. you know, research says this, maybe it might not fit your learning style, yeah, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, I, I agree. But yeah, like being able to fall back on certain strategies like that on top of, mm-hmm you know, trying to read as much as possible in context. I mean, they end up complementing each other, right? So Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's discouraging, mm-hmm. though, right? Like if, you know, you're trying a certain method and it's not working yep. for you, then you hate kanji completely and you don't want to study them. I think that happens a lot to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just hate it. Even, even native Japanese people, right? They don't... Yeah. They're like, oh, why do I have to study this? Why can't we just all do hiragana? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. So I hear a lot of kids say that. In, I'm sure my students feel that way too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like even in, in schools in Japan, you know, that they, they use radicals to teach, right? Like you, you're able, like Japanese people are able to like say the name of the radical and explain a kanji mm-hmm. verbally. They can pick it apart, right? So, you know, it looks like the super complex thing, but it's made up of little parts. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. I mean, in terms of fake kanji, what you would do, I guess, then ultimately, you know, going back to that question is you can take these parts and kind of put them together, right? And in your own little unique way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, discuss that uh, when we come back after the break. Uh, Christine found some very uh, interesting information. So uh, let's get into that in just a moment. And now it's time for a word from our producer, Tony. Hey, it's me. <laughs> uh, all right. So seriously, though. Uh, so, of course, we've been talking about kanji and some very general information about kanji. Uh, and, and for example, we were talking about certain kanji radicals that are always read the same way. If they're in onyomi, uh, again, the Chinese style reading. If you want to go check out that full list, then go to the show notes. That information should be available via your podcast app, but some information relevant 
to what's going to be discussed in the second half of the show is only going to be available on the website. So you're going to have to head on over to japankyo.com slash Ichimon Japan and find episode 22, the fake kanji episode, and you'll get the pictures and all that stuff relating to what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Also, just a reminder, if you haven't listened to the latest episode of Japan Station, well, you can go ahead and do that. In that episode, episode 44, I talked to Matt Alt. Now, Matt is a very well-known localizer, translator, uh, author, and we talk about his latest book, Pure Invention, How Japan's Pop Culture Conquered the World. And I talk a bit about my own relationship with Japanese pop culture and discovering Hello Kitty and my thoughts on Hello Kitty at the beginning and now and all that stuff. So uh, it's a fun episode. We have a pretty casual chat, but we also discuss a few of the topics that he touches on in the book a bit more in depth. So go check that out at japanstationpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now it's time to get back to the kanji and in this second part is where we're really going to be talking about the kind of I guess you could say fake kanji or fabricated kanji that the title refers to so let's get back to the kanji okay so um Christine found something really interesting which involved um like we were saying creating fake made up um original kanji uh so Christine could you explain that yeah, so um, there's a website. I'm sure uh, we'll share it <laughs> somewhere, yeah. but um, yes, it's called uh, yeah. uh, Soul Kanji, right? So basically, mm-hmm. um, it's a competition they have in Japan where you can submit your designs for fake kanji. And a lot of them are like really clever, kind of like funny ways of doing things. But if you look at the main page, the one that I think is my favorite is actually on the front page. It's. Um, Shiori, right? So for bookmark, I think, uh-huh. right? Right. So this one, it has um, on the top, right? It has two, I guess, uh, how do you call it? Maybe dry like characters, kan. Oh, okay. Dry, yeah. Wet, dry. The yeah. Dry, so yeah. they're uh, next to each other on top. And then below that, mm-hmm. they have um, normally underneath, it's just uh, ki, like a uh, tree, right? Underneath. But this one, they actually mm-hmm. made it book. So it looks like there are two little bookmarks sticking out of the book. Yeah, oh. so they just created this kanji and just said, oh, this is how I would write the word for bookmark, right? So stuff like, yeah, that's so I, that's my favorite one. Yeah. A lot of them are like really funny manipulations and stuff. So yeah, so uh-huh. this is their 10th uh, year doing it. Um, yeah, so every yeah. New Year's, a little bit after New Year's, I guess I go ahead and I look at their website and share it on Facebook <laughs> <laughs> so everybody can see all their cute designs. Yeah, but... Um, so I, I guess, so some are just, they look cute. They might look like the representation, the, the thing that they're referring yeah. to. Some might have some sort of like pun or yes. joke in them, I yes, assume. Yes, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are just like, um, just really funny manipulations, but some of them actually, mm. and then it's great because they'll go ahead and show it. They'll they'll give it its own onyomi, its own kunyomi, and oh, that's cool. yeah, a lot of them are, I guess, more like ideographic, I guess, than mm-hmm. this idea of a semantic radical and phonetic radical. But still, it's a mm. lot of fun to look at these sort of things. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, Ryan, any kanji you want to make? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm going to win the contest next. What do you get if you win, actually? Or is there a winner? Um, yeah, there, there is a win- yeah, there are winner. There are multiple winners. They have, like, they have different categories, I think. Um, and then a, bu- a bunch of, like, honorable mentions. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know what the prize is. Um, you get it put on the website, I guess, <laughs> in your design. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm sure. Th- I hope you at least get like a like a hagaki, like a little postcard or something. Yeah, I think there's like you'll probably get a like uh, how do you say like formal paper in the mail or something that's True. like the cer- that kind of certificate. Japan loves certificates, right? So. Thank you for inventing <laughs> this kanji. We will never actually use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I haven't heard of this before today. Is it mostly making new kanji for existing words, or do people also make like new kanji for like new modern words, like? online they do yeah they do exactly yeah so those are yeah those are the more like um i don't know like young people talk that i don't understand but yeah there's (laughs) stuff like that on there (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah. that's cool yeah Yeah, because a lot of um 
you know, there's a lot of like online stuff and there's always just new slang coming up, but those are usually like hiragana katakana, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So like, it'll be like, oh, what is it? Like something like guguru. This is old, old example, right? But things like yeah, that. Yeah, well, guguru, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, to Google yeah, yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're making it into a verb. So you guguru. It. Oh, I, I got to see a kanji for guguru. <laughs> you can make one and submit it and you can win. <laughs> you're in Japan, you yeah. can submit it. <laughs> All right. Well, I will. I will take a look at that website, and maybe I can um, put a few of those on the in the show notes for this, so people can take a look. Uh, um, I assume those are just pictures, right? Because they wouldn't be typable, right? No. Yeah, they're not typable, but they're very yet. Um, yeah, not yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they're very like stylized and stuff. I don't know how uh -huh. they submit them. I'm not sure. Um, but it's probably like a handwritten one, and then they probably. Yeah, I figure, yeah. I'm not sure how they make these these pictures. They probably have to fax them because Japan loves faxes. <laughs> Still. <laughs> or they, they, they like, write it down and physically mail it. That's my guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's cool. So uh, then Christine also found another interesting thing which involved, I guess you would call it a fake kanji. <laughs> um, could you explain the, the ghost kanji thing? Yeah, so this is an article from the Japan Times. I think it was published like two years ago, three years ago mm -hmm. maybe. But it's kind of this idea, it's called a... Uh, yu de emoji, right? So ghost, ghost, ghost characters, ghost I guess. Characters, yeah, yeah, ghost mm -hmm. letters. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, these are characters that are in the dictionary, but they don't have a meaning associated with. They just randomly popped up in the seventies, and then we don't know what they are, right? So it'll mm -hmm. say like the picture they have on here. They have one, and it says there's like unknown meaning. We don't know how to pronounce it or anything. So some of mm -hmm. these, um, what they think is what happened when they were converting everything from kind of like text to like. Um, and being able to encode it on the computer, right? Mm -hmm. That there were like some photocopy smudges and people, <laughs> what, no, seriously. And then they like yeah. made these characters that uh -huh. aren't real, like these like kind of like typo almost things. So there's this character that's in the dictionary, you can type it, but there's uh -huh. no way to pronounce it or there's no meaning associated with it. So it's really cool. I love yeah. the idea that they made mistakes and then there's like, ah, I guess we're just going to keep it forever now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's there. <laughs> yes, there's like a bunch of examples of them. Yeah. Some there of should be another are... contest to give meaning to the empty kanji. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Yes. Yeah. So there's an example here, right? Um, uh -huh. This one's like a, a place name. It's um, Akenbara, right? So the Aken okay. kind of part, right? It's basically Yama on top uh -huh. and then underneath is onna right oh, yeah, yeah so this is so uh, mountain on top and woman on the bottom yeah and then yeah. Uh, for this one um that's the real character but uh -huh. somehow i guess there is a mistake in photocopying or something and they actually have this, an extra line kind of like ichi a straight uh, how do you say it? like a, a oh, straight horizontal yeah line. A straight horizontal <laughs> line in between yama and onna Right. Oh. So it became so a fraction. That, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's a fraction, yeah. <laughs> right. So how do you say? <laughs> so divide yeah. mountain by woman. <laughs> right? So basically, yeah, there's that character that, you know, it's it doesn't have anything associated with it. Uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the one with the the division symbol, as Ryan put uh -huh. it, right? That's a yeah. that's a ghost character. Yeah. Ah. Yep. So they don't have so, any. Do you do you know if this is in the um, whatever the Microsoft language package that would be in Windows, for example? Um, I think this is uh, part of what is it like Unicode input? I think it's like the J I S. It's one of those. I don't know which one, but yeah, a bunch of these popped mm -hmm. up in the '70s when they were trying to basically input this all as like being a being typable for you know yeah whoever was like making that symbol had to be like what the heck is this thing <laughs> whatever <laughs> well yeah probably i also do wonder if there's literally some guy who was like i'm just gonna sneak it in and see if anyone notices <laughs> oh that would be fun he's kind of yeah, like, like hijacking those, uh, the disney dictionary. animators or something right oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so we've got one way to create fake kanji um use you know these radicals and different parts to create something 
kind of fun and original, like you were saying with the kanji contest. Another way to create a fake kanji would be just to be in the 70s when you're digitizing <laughs> these, <laughs> these characters. So yes, time and, travel. Yeah. Don't worry, next, next episode is time travel, how to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is time but travel in you Japan? Could argue, <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you could argue that that is the most legit fake kanji because it's in the dictionary. It's not even fake anymore at that point. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's real. It, well, it's real because apparently nobody's taking the effort to like get rid of them. <laughs> it's not like anyone's really typing them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like nope, nope. This is this is for us. Yeah, I don't care if most people don't know about it. We want it in. You should um, just like name all your kids with these like meaningless pronunciationless kanji. <laughs> they get teased at school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like they'd get bullied. Would they? Because like elementary school kids can't read the kanji anyway. Oh. I don't know. Like there, there's some pretty creative readings of existing kanji already. So yeah. who knows? Who knows? Um, but um, then you have th this other kind of, I guess you could say, category of their real kanji, but. I mean, in a sense, you could also think of them as fake because somebody had to just make these up. They are not part of the kanji that came from China. They are made in Japan kanji. Um, there's a couple names. I I've seen them called wase kanji, which is made in Japan kanji. I've, I've also seen them called kokuji, which is um, country uh, letter or character referring to Japan because kokugo is, is the... Um, when you're at school, you study kokugo, just like in English, we study language arts. Kokuji would be like these letters, these kanji that are created in Japan. And I found a whole long list of these, and they're very, very interesting because they combine the different like radicals, these different components in very interesting ways. Um, and I wanted to talk about a few of these. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to throw one out here, and then we can kind of talk about a few of the other ones that you guys found. Um, but the first one that I wanted to bring up was gomi. So <laughs> gomi is trash or, or garbage, uh, but you write it. And this is a very, very rare kanji. Like you can copy and paste it. Like it does come up in the computer, but when you're hitting the space bar to p make the kanji pop up, it doesn't come up in the default list. So this is not something commonly used, but it is sometimes used in place names. And when I asked a Japanese person, like, have you ever seen this? And like, she was like, I think I may have seen it in a novel at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there's so a place exists. name with gomi? Yeah, yeah. Uh, gomi Watari in um, Aomori Prefecture, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's written with the radical on the left for like dirt. Uh, and on the right, the character for flower. <laughs> so I guess the idea is that kind of like composting when you bury the trash in oh. the dirt you're gonna get flowers and vegetation right I, I guess so i read one little post that seemed to be implying that um so i thought that was a cute thing but again most people are probably not going to be aware of this but it, it is an actual legit thing that exists but i guess somebody uh who knows 100 200 years ago just thought this would be a nice thing and then they just made it up and somehow it spread from there <laughs> Uh, so Ryan what was one that you found that that caught your attention so there was a couple I found because one thing that stood out to me was that like very I was expecting this list to be mostly like archaic or weird words mm -hmm. I guess and many mm -hmm. of them are but some of them are super super common and that kind of surprised me yeah so for an example of a common one would be hataraku which means to work mm -hmm. which they took mm -hmm. person next to move to make mm-hmm and it's yeah. just, I was just surprised that like such an everyday one was true in this category. Another one, this is for a much stupider reason, is mm -hmm. I think it's a fish because I just looked it up called Konoshiro. I don't know anything about mm -hmm. fish. And the mm -hmm. reason it stood out is because the English translation is gizzard shad, which just sounds awesome. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the heck's a gizzard shad? <laughs> yeah, I looked it up. Apparently it's a fish. But <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's made from fish and winter. So I guess you catch them in the winter is my guess, but probably, oh. yeah. That, that's yeah, just yeah. completely a guess. But the important thing is that in English, it's called a gizzard shad. <laughs> yeah, man. So, geez, a gizzard shad. Excuse me, ma'am. Do you have any gizzard shads? <laughs> kind like of a funny thing is shad. like, so in Japan, 
fish are very popular and common, so everyone kind of knows the names of fish. Yep. But I think most Americans don't know the names of that many fish. So yep. lots of times people would look things up in like Japanese to English dictionaries before talking to me and ask questions like, oh, do you enjoy gizzard chad? And I would honestly just be like, what the heck is that? <laughs> that has not happened with specifically gizzard chad, but it has happened with many, many fish I've never heard of. Yeah, like um, sama, which is a very, very, very popular fish to eat in the fall. Um, the English is Pacific Sari. Mm. Nobody that, that has never been to Japan would, would know that in the U.S., right? Like, yeah, but they just sort of assume you do. Sari. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but sama. So a lot of times when I'm talking to people that speak Japanese and they understand these things, I don't even bother with the English because I may not even know it. I just say the Japanese. Um, so uh, yeah. So uh, Christine, uh, what about what? What did you? Uh, what did cat? What caught your attention in that list? So the one there are three in here that are all mm -hmm. for the word for uh, like a sleigh, sorry, right? Yeah, so, like a winter sleigh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, these ones, it's really funny because I know these from a Japanese like variety show, like a quiz show. That mm -hmm. I watched, like, I think it was the second time I studied abroad, where, mm -hmm. right, and these ones, um, on the left-hand side, it has boat, and on the right-hand side, it has uh, snow, oh, and then, the, so cute. yeah, and then another one, same same reading, it's still sorry, sleigh, right, it mm -hmm. has car, or wheel, I guess, car, uh, kuruma, right, on the left, and then mm -hmm. snow on the right, and then the last one it's moon on the left, which is weird because when I think of moon being on the left for a radical, I think of like an organ, like some kind of body yeah, usually, part. Right? Yeah, body parts <laughs> usually have that in there, yeah. Yeah, and then on the right it has snow. So there's these three. So these are all the kokuji, but the ones that are, the one that is actually borrowed from Chinese, mm -hmm. it's um, wood on the left. And then three, like, how do you say, hair? Not Not hair. Like fur stacked, oh, yeah. like in a little like pyramid kind of shape, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, so that's the sled or sleigh one that is like mm -hmm. borrowed from like actual Chinese, and then it has these three. So for some reason, there are four ways to write sled or sleigh. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Like, <laughs> I mean, I I think it it might perhaps, snow I, a I lot. Don't know. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Well, there are many parts of Japan that snow a lot, and there's a lot of dialects. So who knows? Maybe like each little part of Japan, they uh, said like you know they use their own sleighs and they made up their own version of this kanji. Perhaps yeah. I, who knows, right? But that seems possible. Mm -hmm. Um. So uh, another real quick, I found one, a better one. Yeah. I'm still going through oh, the list. Please so, go. Sachihoko. Sachihoko, like like the the fish the, like the dolphin the, thing yeah, yeah yeah just again the english translation is fabulous dolphin like fish <laughs> oh i see it i see it killer well there's the yeah. other one. <laughs> but fabulous is important for this animal so you should yeah, describe you should describe how do, how do they write it what's on the left what's on the right well the left is fish the right what is, how do you describe the right i don't know the kanji uh, parts as well. um how do you say uh tiger tiger Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, tiger. Yeah, so yeah. Oh. fish tiger, fish tiger. But it's a nice. it's a fabulous dolphin like. Fish. Yeah, where's the, where's the fabulous come into that? <laughs> the tiger, <laughs> the stripes. Fish can be pretty fabulous. <laughs> I suppose. So, so ju just a little context for shachihoko. Um, I think when when people in Japan hear shachihoko, many if not most they would think immediately Nagoya. think. Nagoya, exactly. Because yeah. Nagoya. Nagoya Castle is famous for having this, like, what do you call it? Like a Golden statue ornament? Fish, yeah. Yeah, this kind of fabulous, like, dolphin <laughs> fish. <laughs> and it, it's referred to as, like, the, the Shachihoko. And the, the, the whole castle often, you know, is associated with this Shachihoko. So, yeah. that Apparently, the English is fabulous. What was it? Fabulous dolphin like fabulous fish. Fabulous dolphin like right? fish. There you go. So when a Japanese person in Nagoya, you, let's say you make a friend in Nagoya and he or she asks you, oh, do you know fabulous dolphin-like fish? Now you know what they're talking about. Right? <laughs> what their Google so Translate. It's important to know this word will not work for a normal dolphin-like fish. It must be a fabulous dolphin-like fish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think, I think you found the best word in the whole list. <laughs> I'll include the link to the list, of course, in, in the show notes. Um, so, yeah, I, I was going to say... Um, 
couple other interesting things that I found. One, just I, I found this one because I happen to enjoy um, the anime Initial D, which is all about like um, car, like these street racers racing on these mountain roads and they drift. And I, I was a very big fan of that when that was, you know, far more popular like 10 years ago. Um, and there's a word that comes up in that show. And I learned this word from that show, toge. Toge is uh, the word for mountain pass. And the kanji is one of these kokuji, these one of these made in Japan uh, kanji. And the kanji is on the left, mountain. Okay, makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, vertically, on the top right, you have uh, up, I think. And then on the bottom, it was down, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, kind of like self-explanatory, right? Like you're going up and down on the road, on the mountain. It's a mountain pass. Um, so that was just nice. I, I liked it. Um, also, toge can also mean in a more metaphorical sense, like a a point of crisis. So for example, mm. if you're in a, you just had like a, a big surgery and you're in the ICU and then you make it through that, you might say, toge o koeta. You oh. overcame that mountain pass in that metaphorical sense, right? You got through the most dangerous part. Now you're on the mend. Um, so it has this kind of other, you know, more poetic sort of meaning to it. Um, but then... The other aspect that I that I really really found interesting that that I sent me on this whole tangent reading a couple different articles um, was the metric system in Japanese, <laughs> and so of course you know nowadays you know if you learn if you learn Japanese you learn like metoru uh, and guramu right mm. gram gram and and the uh, ritoru is liter right like the whole metric measuring system but in the Meiji period or and even leading up to the Meiji period they apparently were already using the metric system and they started using kanji instead of katakana, right? So, for example, meter was written initially and this was uh, around like the 1890s. 1891 seems to be when like newspapers and stuff started to really like push this and it became more widespread. But initially, initially it was used rice, kome, and totsu, which is from like totsu zen, which means suddenly. Totsu mm. doesn't seem to have any clear sort of meaning in and of itself. It's more like of an emphatic kind of usage. Um, so kome totsu would be read metoru, <laughs> right? Mm. And this is a case of ateji, which is when you kind of force readings onto a kanji that it didn't originally have. They just kind of sound like it, but you know, it, it's a new reading that is inspired by the already existing reading. So metoru was originally rice totsu, but then when they started using it in the newspapers and more widespread, apparently they just cut the totsu off and just would write oh. it kome. So, oh, okay. Like, That's why yeah. I see that, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even today, you still occasionally see kome used to uh, refer to uh, meters, um, especially I was reading one post of this woman or guy that worked in the real estate industry and um, he, he or she was saying like, you know, I never really thought about it after working like 10 years in the real estate industry, but why do we use rice to refer to meters? Because <laughs> obviously so one go, grain of rice is a meter long. <laughs> if you haven't been <laughs> yeah, to Japan, the rice is enormous. <laughs> well, it, I mean, th this just, you know, I, I had to do this, but I asked a friend of mine like, uh, in Japanese, right? It's like, how many rice are you tall, right? Like, I, 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 <laughs> two. I know. That was it. Uh, <laughs> right? Like, something like that. <laughs> and um, even today, you, you still see um, Hebe. Hebe is um, cubic meters, I think. Um, oh. Like, you still see that written every once in a while. Now, these other usages, for example, gram was the same kanji for kawara, which is a roof title. Roof <laughs> tile. Right, these classic Japanese roof tiles, you would use this kanji to write gram. And then tatsu, um, you would use this kanji, which tatsu means to stand, or sometimes it's pronounced uh, like ri or ritu. ritu. Um, by itself, it isn't really used. Um, it's usually used in combina combination. That would refer to leaders. And then here's where the kokuji aspect of this comes into place, these made in Japan um, uh, kanji they would combine it with other things. So, for example, if you wanted to say decameter, which is 10, what, what is it, like 10 meters, right? Yeah, yeah, 10, yeah. 10 meters, decameter. You would put like the kanji for 10 next to the kome, the rice. 
right? And that's one character that would mean decameter. So oh. millimeter and all these different ones, all these different units had their own original made in Japan kanji. It was fascinating. Fast, even like inches and and pounds and stuff. They all had their own kanji. Imperial now, those, too. Yeah, like oh, wow. none of those are used anymore. <laughs> yeah, I. Those are all new to me looking at this list. Yeah, but back in the like Meiji period, this was a thing for a while. Um, and then eventually, I guess they just went all katakana. But very, very interesting and something that I, I really didn't know about. And apparently most Japanese people don't really think about it, even though komi is still sometimes used. Rice is still sometimes used to refer to meters. Mm. Yeah. That's the only one I still rarely occasionally see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite rare, but, you know, especially if you're involved in probably in construction or real yeah, estate, yeah. <laughs> things that involve measurements, I guess you see it there more often. There has been a general trend towards katakana becoming more popular recently, because I'm thinking, especially with animal names, all of them have kanji, but yeah. many of them recently are most naturally written in katakana. Yeah, yeah. My understanding is that when you write it in katakana, it has a more scientific kind of nuance to it uh. and of course japanese people are also like everybody else they get lazy and they just rather write things in hiragana and katakana a lot of times so <laughs> i feel like dog and cat are still normally kanji and almost everything else is katakana yeah like one on the one of those originally japan created ones was ebi shrimp yeah i saw oh. that because ebi is an important kanji <laughs> yeah, Ebi is, is very important. Shrimp. I, I love shrimp. <laughs> We're very passionate about this. <laughs> Ebi. Oh, um, it's kind of what? funny because I feel like half the list is like different seafood names. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me think like, how do you write it in the original Chinese? Like, Oh, wait, I found it. I found it. So, oh. okay. So for Chinese for shrimp, on the left hand side is uh, bug, mushi. Okay. And then uh-huh. on the right hand side is shita down uh-huh. like kudasai kudasaru that kind of okay okay yeah. so it's the down bug down down bug yeah so, hey guys it's... you want to get some down bug tonight <laughs> fried down bug <laughs> down bug fried. what was the how was the one in japanese written uh it's uh, old man and bug old man yeah, it's, right? it's old and? man bug old bug yeah old man bug which because the um the the shrimps are curved right so it looks like a hunched old man the bug one's another oh. one that's sometimes like not on insects, I guess. Mm-hmm. I actually yeah, yeah. asked my husband about this. Mm-hmm. So things like um, snakes, bugs, um, frogs, those sort of things, they're kind of in this category of like, I don't, how do you explain like it? Like icky Mishu. animal or something? Yeah, kind of like those. I don't know how to describe I, it. So it's not because frogs eat bugs. It's because they're in the same category. Because frog, yeah, I was always the... kind of curious. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, frog. Mm-hmm. I think lizard, tadpole, to in Chinese. In ta- uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like no, Iyana no. Dobutsu. I, I have so many <laughs> Chinese storybooks for my son right now that I'm learning like yeah. all these really weird characters for like these <laughs> animals. And a lot of them use the bug radical. And I'm like, oh, that's that, that's considered a bug. OK, <laughs> this is why it's kind of difficult to learn kanji is because you see this radical like this means bug. Like, OK, and here it is on snake. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a really Did people old think it was a giant worm. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's just a just, different category. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this categorization for... I don't know. Isn't there... This is a little off topic, but isn't there an anime called Mushishi or something? Yeah, I think is. they talk yeah. about that kind of idea of what mushi are. Uh, that kind I of think, means it doesn't actually mean bug. It just means yeah, like... Yeah, it's like... like icky um, animal. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the vibe that I'm getting, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh. We solved the mystery of mushi. <laughs> Now yeah, for all the okay. 700 other mysterious kanji. <laughs> <laughs> like, why is moon used for organs? <laughs> That's yeah. a good point. That is. They're probably, I, well, it might just be that it's not that many things have to do with the moon. So they just figured, like, let's just use it for this, too. <laughs> I think, wasn't it related to, like, bone or something like that? I think I read about this, like, years ago, but I can't remember. Uh, oh, why they use yeah, moon, moon for, for organ organs. Stuff. Yeah. I might be totally wrong on that. I'd have to, I, yeah, I didn't look that up, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So um, sometimes fake kanji become real kanji, just like Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> but only if they're good boys. Yes. Yep, yep. Only if they're good boys 
and they were implemented like or mistakes I don't know, a while ago. What? Or if they're mistakes. Or if they're mistakes, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, so for anyway. that like kanji contest, you should just intentionally send like a really blurry photocopied one and be like, "I'm just trying to keep it authentic." <laughs> Let them fill in the gaps. <laughs> You're like, yeah, this is how those those ghost kanji were actually formed. So I'm paying homage to that by sending in a blurry kanji. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So uh, fake kanji, uh, please. Um, I mean, you know, if you're interested in creating your own fake kanji, learn some of those radicals and mix them up in some interesting, fun ways and, and have some fun. I think, you know, playing with, with when you really like like to do, I mean, it's clear Christine, like Christine, you really like kanji. Yeah. You, you like to learn these things, and and I think you end up learning, uh, like totally needless things. But yeah, you also definitely. end up learning a whole lot of really useful stuff. It is a good feeling when you like learn some stupid obscure kanji, and then like four years later, you actually see it, and like, oh, I can read that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, and like this kind of kokuji, like made in Japan kanji, and this whole like metric system thing. It is good conversation stuff. Like a lot of Japanese people are not fully aware of this. And you can tell them like, oh, you know why why rice actually means meter? And then they'll go like, oh, I, you know what? I never thought about that. And you can tell them the whole story. So it, this stuff does come into play in, in terms of like being able to have conversations and, and start. And more like, than just, you think. You know, yeah, approach people. Like, I mean, there's only so many times you can talk about your favorite foods and favorite colors and your hobbies, right? <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes throwing in a bit of random weird trivia uh, does help uh, make friends. Yeah. All right. So anything else, guys? Ryan, any other weird kanji? Christine, anything else? Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything. All right. So kanji I, can I, be fun, but it's also obnoxious. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. luck with so, it. I mean, there's just so much more we could discuss with kanji, but yeah, that, I think um, that that that's a whole like I don't know, 100 episode series. So um, I think that's we're good for today. <laughs> if uh, any of you guys, listeners, have any uh, interesting kanji information that you want to send us or any questions, uh, you can email us ichimon at japankyo dot com. Of course, remember to subscribe, rate, review. Um, User kanji to leave us a review. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to Christine and it'll make her happy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Christine, for, for coming on and, and, and teaching us a bit about kanji and, and finding those interesting stories. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Ryan, for being Ryan. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. It's, it's very difficult, to be honest. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>